a lot of his history, so I will give him give you a summary of General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, uh, research him from various pub publications on the West Coast and and the Defense Department and uh, a museum in Philadelphia and Norfolk, Virginia, where he's buried, and uh, have a couple of collectors copies of magazines with pictorial presentation that I'd be glad to look at. And uh, I, uh, and then I have copies. I thought what impressed me a lot when I go through them was his uh, beautiful speech uh, ad-libbed at West Point in 1962. I have a copy of that here. And also his speech when he was leaving and, and came back to speak before Congress. And that's in here. And you know, as I read both speeches, especially the one before Congress, uh, there's a lot of um, stuff in there that makes a lot of sense to me that if some of his edicts and conversation had been carried forth, maybe, maybe we may not have some of the problems we have now overseas. It had something to do with both MacArthur and General Patton. And uh, so he was involved with the transfer at that time of, of, um, of some way, somehow, of both General Patton and General MacArthur. So what I'm about to do is give, and, and I have the speeches here, you're welcome to have them. It's give you a, a brief summary that I put together of the general. Uh, how many have any, have had any connection personally or otherwise with General MacArthur? Worked with him, transferred him. Uh, my connection, uh, very remote, uh, his, he was general of the 42nd Rainbow Division in World War I, a very, very young age. And, uh, and the, the 42nd Rainbow Division was reorganized and reinstituted in uh, 1941 at uh, Camp Gruber, Oklahoma, under General, General Harry Collins. And when I got into service, I got involved with that group there. And uh, in the uh, 42nd Rainbow Division. And I'll give you a, a basic summary of the capsule career of General Douglas MacArthur. He's born on officer's row at the government arsenal in Little Rock, 1980. His father was General Arthur MacArthur, who was only, seven, he, only 17 when he was appointed a lieutenant in Milwaukee 24th Regimental in 1862, and was a colonel three years later, known as the Boy Colonel of the West. From his father, he heard stories of the Civil War, Custer's Last Stand, and so on, and father was a hero in the Spanish-American War. His mother was Mary Pickney Hard of Norfolk, once referred to her as my sainted mother. And as a 19-year-old plebe at West Point, because of his uh, brilliance at that time and pride, even at that uh, 19, he was hazed so unmercifully in 1899 that he became subject of congressional investigation at that time at West Point, wondering what was going on with, with the, this plebe. He was married, he, he was named first captain of cadets, a top honor West Point could offer, and was graduated first in scholarship with an average of 98.1, the highest of any cadet in 800 years, one of the few times in history the academy, at the academy that the first captain was also the first in scholarship. Upon his graduation, the Lieutenant MacArthur attended engineer school at Fort Belvoir and served as a White House aide to President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. As a first lieutenant, he was assigned as an aide de camp to his father in Tokyo who had been asked to make a study of the colonial lands of the Far East. 
This gave Lieutenant MacArthur an understanding and interest in the Far East Orient, which later very much affected his future actions. In 1913, he became superintendent of the State War and Naval Building. A year later, during the Mexican Rebellion, Captain MacArthur was sent as a special emissary of the War Department of Mexico. And at that time, he distinguished himself so well he was recommended for the Medal of Honor. He returned to Washington and was reassigned military aid to Secretary of War Newton Baker. During World War I, he was the youngest division commander. That's where the 42nd Infantry Rainbow Division came in play in France, and the youngest general, only 38 years old, at the end of the war. The, the newspaper nailed him as the D'Artagnan of the AEF. He personally led the men in some of the most severe fighting without enumerating some of the battles, and he was gassed and wounded several times and received 12, 13 decorations. After the war, uh, the Secretary Baker said the general was the best frontline officer in the country has ever had. From 1919 and 1922, he was superintendent of West Point, the youngest superintendent the academy ever had. How many West Point graduates we have here? Oh, we don't, okay, I thought we did. He became a major general in 1925, the youngest at that rank, the, the same year he sat on the historic court-martial of General Billy Mitchell and was reportedly the only member of that jury voting for acquittal. He was married to Mrs. Louise Cromwell Brooks in 1922, marriage ended in divorce in 29, and then he married Jean Marie Fairkoff of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, April 1937, and their only son, Arthur, majored in English at Columbia University. 37, 1937, his tour of duty was chief of staff, as chief of staff ended, he retired from the army to become field marshal of the Philippine forces because of his knowledge previously in the Far East. He returned active duty four years later July 26, 1947, as the U.S. was threatened by war. His first assignment after recall to active duty, that was before Pearl Harbor, was the defense of the Philippines. That was his first assignment. In 42, he was summoned from the Philippines to take supreme command of the Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific, and he vowed he would return, and he kept that vow. And you know, I shall return. But, he left the islands in March of that year in a small, frail torpedo boat and under the cloak of darkness landed in Darwin, Australia, March 11th. And upon completing his hazardous journey to Australia from the foxhole to Bataan in, in, in Peninsula, he said and stated publicly, and I came through and, and I shall return. He organized at that time a very successful aggressive island hoppy, hopping campaign, which led to the victory, victorious return to the Philippines. Before his return, his forces climbed the rugged New Guinea coast, then left New Guinea in a huge convoy to strike at Leyte. At that time, he was very resentful of the policies which placed Europe at that time ahead of the strategy of the Pacific. His friends contended he was fighting two fronts, the Pacific and the one in Washington. So he, he already had some, some dissolution with Washington at that time. He returned to the Philippines in October 90, 1944, invading Leyte Island and promising not to relax his grip until Bataan and Corregidor once more rose to, to their life. On January 1945, he went back to Luzon, the island on which Bataan and Corregidor are located. On July 5th, 1945, General MacArthur proudly announced that the island had been won back in the greatest disaster ever sustained by the Japanese arm. Uh -huh. and, but 
we had the, this, you may, I think all of you have seen this photo, and I'll pass it around. He made a big thing on landing in Leyte, and it was a photo, at, at first it was a photo start, photo uh, time. We were, I was in the Philippines at that time, and we were uh, commanded, I guess, to make sure the beach, 100 yard, 200 yard, I forget the dimension, was clean of all pebbles, and uh, water uh, for a six footer would only be knee high. And it was a command. And I know if, if, <laughs> if, if someone leaving that convoy had tripped, I may not be here, or the rest of my platoon would not be here. But it was, it was the beach was like the, like the Gulf Coast of Fort Destin. And I'll pass this around. December 2nd, 1945, General MacArthur boarded the battleship Missouri. And this is after all the battles were won and, and so forth, uh, on Tokyo Bay, and as Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, signed the surrender articles which ended World War II. And, and I'll pass uh, of General MacArthur with the Japanese on board the Missouri. You pass those around, you know, please. He guided occupation of Japan for five years, seven months, and 15 days. He exercised his dictatorship over the Japanese people with such benevolence that they came to respect with the kind of reverence they formed and reserved for their emperor. He counted among the major accomplishments of victory over communism. General MacArthur, uh, he was a proud um, uh, individual. Uh, very proud of his accomplishments, uh, very uh, dictatorial, but, but fair. Uh, and if you liked him, you loved him. And he was loved in the Philippines because he was their protector, almost their God. And if you didn't like him, you really hated him because of his demands and, command of, and his command of, of working with you or against you. But he was a, a very complete strategist. Uh, he, he had an opinion, and how dare anyone try to change that opinion. He was that kind of an individual. In 1950, the Korean communists started on their march conquest. The UN Secretary General acted to stop the invasion of South Korea and count, and count on all UN members to render every assistance to that effort. They authorized a unified command and asked the United States to name a supreme commander and President Truman appointed General MacArthur at that time as the supreme commander of the Pacific forces. Overcoming the advantage that the North Koreans had in the beginning, he gradually gained the upper hand. Then with a brilliant landing uh, behind the enemy lines he snuck one on him. At Incheon, near Seoul, he broke the back of the North Korean army and broadcast an ultimatum for its surrender. He thought the war was over, but he didn't count on the Chinese Reds at that time. At this point, the Chinese Reds suddenly intervened and turned certain Allied victories into a bitter holding war. That brought about what he called an entirely new war, and the UN forces were pushed back. Many critics at this point believe that the general had acted too hasty in launching his end of the war at that time, but it failed, because he didn't count on the force and brutality of the Chinese Reds at that time, so that's when we had that Korean, tough Korean conflict. He, mainland, with the aid of Chiang Kai-shek's troops, he also wanted to bomb the Chinese in Manchuria. He claimed that orders forbidding uh, this activity would place this forces under an enormous handicap without precedent in military history. He just, whenever he did something, he believed in winning. Victory was his montage. Without victory, he said, there is no game. Then came a series of public statements which added up to the open opposition to 
President Truman's own policy of keeping the war in the Korean Peninsula under tight limitation as possible. Finally, on April 11th, 51, President Truman fired General MacArthur. Papers played it up. There was no hint of criticism of MacArthur as a soldier. In fact, this statement setting forth the reasons for dismissing him, President Truman said, General MacArthur's place in history as one of our greatest commanders is fully established. The nation owes him a debt of gratitude for the distinguished and exceptional service he has rendered to his country at, in post of great responsibility. A week later, the general returned to the United States and addressed the Congress using the phrase, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And, and I have a complete speech in this handout here, which became part of the national heritage with, with a jaunty barracks cap, his sunglasses, and a corn cob pipe that was publicized at that particular time. And I hope, uh, if you haven't read his speech to Congress, if you will take time, it, 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 it's not lengthy, but it, there's enough uh, meat and potatoes in it that it, it, um, uh, it, you reminisce back then if you were in that category, but you think of what's going on now, and some of his, as I mentioned earlier, some of his stuff would make sense and may be advantageous if we had accomplished that, but anyway, uh, he's a five-star general, or was. Over 12,000 persons waited at the National Airport until past midnight to greet the general, then 71 years old, as he arrived in a plane called the Bataan. Some hailed some half million line the parade route up to Pennsylvania Avenue. This was the first return of the general in 14 years. Most of his time was in the Philippines and the Pacific. It was the same story in New York the next day when seven and a half million people, I can't imagine, seven and a half million, I'll pass that on. I wish I had seven and a half million people at that time turned out to cheer the deposed hero, just as thousands had turned out for him in San Francisco. MacArthur immediately became a possible contender for the Republican presidential nomination in 52. He toured the country, sharply criticizing President Truman's Korean policies. However, at the convention in 52, the Republican, Republican chose Dwight Eisenhower, a former MacArthur aide, as their candidate for president, who later be, who became president. General MacArthur quietly took a job, a, I, I like this, this description, a 68,000 yearly as chairman of the Remington Rand Company, now Sperry Rand Company, he withdrew to a tower suite in New York, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, except for an occasional speech, a trip to West Point, or something uh, in, in resolving an Olympic dispute, the general remained a seemingly isolated figure. He was quite uh, active with the, the Olympic, Olympics and, and any dispute that might arise, they, General MacArthur sometimes was called in. As a five-star general of the Army, still on active duty, that, that rank cannot be retired. He had a three-room office in downtown New York, manned by a master sergeant, a warrant officer, and a civilian administrative assistant. But the general rarely visited the office. He presided in public at Sperry Rand's stockholders meetings once a year, and monthly board meetings of the corporation were conducted in his living room at the Waldorf Astoria. His living room was furnished in Oriental style with carvings, ancient screens, and other mementos of the Far East. Then President <coughs> Hoover had a dinner for him. Shortly after this, he underwent a prostate operation. 61, he went back to the Philippines for a hero welcome. He received many honors in his retirement years. President Kennedy paid him numerous courtesies. On May 12, 62, he made his that roll call with West Point and delivered his first major address. 
and I'll, I'll uh, refer that to him. On this last photo of the, gen of the General MacArthur was made March 13th when President Johnson visited the ailing soldier in Walter Reed Hospital. He faded away April 5th, 1964 at 84 years old. His body was taken to New York by motorcade. On Wednesday, the flag drape casket was brought back to Washington by train for a procession past the White House and laid in the rotunda. And on Saturday, the body was flown to Norfolk for burial at the MacArthur Memorial, which had been opened to the public on January 26, 64, and was fashioned out of a Norfolk 114-year-old City Hall Courthouse. The journal was buried in the crypt next to his wife in the foreground. And I, and this is Norfolk, and they have a, a I understand, I haven't been there, a wonderful museum of the general as well as his wife. And the crypt, you can't see it, but it's in the forefront. Why? That pretty much is a summary that I have. And, uh, I'd like, at this time, take some time to read. And, and I, I hadn't read it before until I started researching the general. And without prepared text or notes, he eloquently, General Douglas MacArthur, spoke his farewell to the cadets at West Point. And it's called Duty, Honor, Country. The following is word, verbatim is what well, I say is a portion of the address Douglas MacArthur gave after his acceptance of the Sylvanus Thayer Award for service to the nation. I don't know what that award was, but it, my understanding is the outstanding award given to an individual who does most for, most for his community, his state, and his country. Honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying point to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, and to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. That's a, that paragraph's a mouthful. The unbe unbelievers will say they are but words, but a slogan, but a flamboyant phrase. Every pendant, every demagogue, every cynic, every hypocrite, every troublemaker, and I am sorry to say some others of an entirely different character, will try to downgrade them even to the extent of mockery and ridicule. But these are some of the things they build. They build your basic character. They mold you for your future roles. The, the, the custodians of nation's defense. They make you strong enough to know when to know when you are weak and brave enough to face yourself when you are afraid. In 20 campaigns on 100 battlefields around 1,000 campfires, I have witnessed that in during fortitude, that, that patriotic self-abnegation and that invincible determination which have carved the American man at arms to the hearts of his people. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts and on their lips, the hope that we go on to victory. Their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decision victory, always victory. Yours is the profession of arms, is he addressing the cadets. The will to win, the sure knowledge that in war there is no substitute for victory, that if you lose, the nation will be destroyed. 
that the obsession of your public service must be duty, honor, and country. The shadows are lightning for me. The twilight is here. My days of old vanished, lot, taunt, and tent. They have gone glimmering through the dreams of things that were. Their memory is one of wondrous beauty, watered by tears and coaxed and caresses by the smiles of yesterday. Listen verily, but with thirsty ear, for the withering melody of faint bugles blowing reveille of the far drums beating the long roll. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, I always come back to West Point. Always there, always there echoes, and echoes, echoes duty, honor, and country. Today marks my final roll call with you, but I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last conscious thought will be of the core, and the core, and the core. And I bid you farewell. Now that's a mouthful. That, that ends my uh, 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 presentation. I have a quote on one of the, on one of the uh, collector's copy. It's written by Emerson. When nature removes a great man, people explore the horizon for a successor. But none comes, and none will. His class is extinguished with him. In some others, and quite different field, the next man will appear. That's the end of that. Thank you very much. When he was commanding, uh, at that time I was a lieutenant, but I, my platoon and other platoons were uh, scrubbing the beach. Uh, and we know what the purpose was. And, uh, but uh, from all I hear when I was there, I was there, Philippines, about 14 months. Uh, he was very, a proud man, proud of his heritage, proud of his position, and very, very proud of his country. And he would do anything to win whatever the competition would be. And, uh, and of course, I mentioned earlier, uh, the only connection, far remote, I got on the 42nd Rainbow Division in 41, and then after training, my, my gang went to uh, the Belgian Bulge, and, and I lost 36 of the 48 we had at that time. But I was ordered to Benning to work with the Rangers and get, get my commission. And then from there, I uh, trained for the, the Philippine area, and that's when I, uh, to, to bring the Philippines uh, more or less under control and get rid of the rest of the Japanese that were hanging around. And, but uh, I, I, I thought about what I would say tonight, and uh, this guy, General, always comes on my mind, and uh, like he says, old soldiers never die. And, uh,